<clears throat> it being 6.33 on November 15th, um, the meeting um, of this, this meeting of the Brockton Conservation Commission is called to order. The meeting is being conducted remotely in accordance with Governor Healy's open meeting changes updated in March of 2023, which extended certain COVID-19 uh, provisions until March 31st, 2025. Real-time public participation and comment can be addressed to the Conservation Commission utilizing the Zoom virtual meeting software. If you wish to comment during a public input portion of the hearing, please use the raise your hand function to be addressed at the appropriate time. For those of you joining by phone only, please press star nine to raise your hand. All comments made are a matter of public record and should be conducted in a way that is respectful of others. Should personal or inflammatory remarks be made during the meeting, the host reserves the right to mute the speaker. A copy of this recording will be on the city's webpage. All votes taken during this meeting will done by a roll call vote to ensure count accuracy. Commissioners, please state your first and last name for the record in order that we might determine quorum. Laura Beekler, here. Ruby, Ruby Clay, here. Peggy Curtis, here. Kelly Green, here. Sharifa Mapp, here. And Joyce Forrest, here. And quorum is established. Thank you. Um, okay. So the first item on the agenda are meeting minutes. Um, has everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes from October 18th? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may? Yes. Uh, we, As you and I discussed earlier, uh, we uh, did put together a separate uh, uh, minutes uh, for the October 4th meeting. Uh, it is uploaded to the drive. It's two sentences long. I can I read it to, to everyone I uh, to approve that. that now. Okay, I was going to do that right after this, but if you'd like to do oh, that now, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Whatever order you want to do them in, uh, but I just wanted to make you sure, uh, make you aware that that both, both uh, the October fourth okay. and eighteenth both have separate minutes that need to be approved. Thank okay. you. Okay, I was just going to do this one since everyone had it, and yeah, okay. So if if you could have a, a identity vote, please. Um, as far as the minutes, are there any questions or comments or anything concerning the minutes? Or that would be for October eighteenth. Make a motion to accept the minutes from October 18. Thank you, Laura. Motion's been made. I second the motion. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Green aye. Map aye. And Voris aye. Those minutes have been accepted. Um, Within that agenda, as, as Kyle was stating, um, as you might remember on November 4th, I, I'm sorry, October 4th, there was an original meeting scheduled, which actually had to be um, delayed and postponed until that special meeting on October 18th. Those minutes simply state the meeting was canceled due to te technical difficulties with the Zoom webinar software. This meeting was rescheduled till October 18th, 2023. Does anyone have questions on that? Um, Madam Chair, I'm not sure what, uh, we, we've, we've changed it since then. Uh, the current oh, version that, that's that's actively up now on the drive. Uh, do you mind if I read that? Not at all, please. I, I thought I had received the correct one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you, you probably printed it off before we made the change about two hours ago. So, oh, okay. uh, so the, the current version reads, uh, the meeting was canceled due to technical difficulty, difficulties with the Zoom webinar software. Agenda items planned to be discussed at the October 4th, 2023 meeting were heard at the October 18th, 2023 special meeting of the Brockton Conservation Commission. That sounds much better. Thank you. Okay. So members of the commission, um, any questions at all on those minutes? No. I entertain a motion then to accept the minutes from that very short October 4th meeting. Make a motion to accept the minutes from October 4th, 2023. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, roll call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Green aye. Map aye. And Voris aye. Thank you very much. So the meetings are all, the, minute, the minutes are all accepted. Thank you. Okay, so that's good. Okay, 
the next real item on the agenda would be a certificate of compliance for 728 North Cary Street. Um, there also is a certificate of compliance for 744 North Cary Street. They're both closely interconnected. Um, is Mr. Uh, is someone from Jay Holmgren going to be speaking on the issue? Yeah, I believe uh, Scott's got his hand raised. I'll promote him. And then um, Jim Morrissey, I believe, also is in uh, in the as an attendee. So I'm going to promote Scott to panelist. I'm going to go ahead and promote uh, James Morrissey as well. Okay. Certainly we'll need two separate votes, but I think the information is similar for both. Yes, that's correct. Oh. There we go. Uh, Scott, your volume, uh, your mic volume is very low. How would I fix that, Kyle? You speak louder, just like that, Scott. Perfect. <laughs> All right, perfect. That's easier than fixing the mic. All right, thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, Commission members. Uh, Scott Faria from Holmgren Engineering. Uh, here with Jim Morrissey. Uh, Jim is the developer of these, the two lots. Right now, we're speaking of 728. As you mentioned, Madam Chair, the one immediately following was 744 North Cary Street. Uh, two new homes that were permitted uh, back in 2019 by the Conservation Commission. We received two orders of conditions. Uh, work proceeded on both lots, was completed, and we filed for certificate of compliances in August 2020. Uh, the houses were complete. The site work was complete. At that time, it was found by the previous conservation agent that some trees had been removed uh, within the buffer zone, and also that there was a lot of Japanese knotweed uh, that had sprouted up and that, that she would like taken care of. So at the time, we received a partial certificate of compliance that allowed Mr. Morrissey to close on the two houses. And as part of that partial certificate of compliance, we entered into a, uh, an agreement with ERC, uh, Brad Holmes from ERC, to both monitor the removal of the Japanese knotweed and also to come up with a buffer zone enhancement plan to put in some, uh, some plantings to mitigate and offset whatever was lost in that in those resource areas during construction. Uh, the main point of, of that uh, monitoring was the condition that we wait three years just to make sure that all the plants that we replaced, just to make sure that they held. Uh, again, that was about August of 2020, now being November of 2023, uh, we're past the three year window uh, the whole time Brad Holmes has been involved in the project, has monitored uh, the plantings. Uh, we submitted his letter along with our certificate of compliance request. Uh, at this point, we feel like everything is, uh, is complete and is uh, up to date and in, in good standing with your partial certificate that was issued uh, back then in 2020. The other major issue, Madam Chair, just to uh, kind of let everybody know how, how it goes. The order of conditions needs to be cleared from the title in order to have a closing when you're buying a house. In this case, as I said, we couldn't get a, a certificate of compliance because of those plantings and the monitoring. So a partial certificate is typically uh, accepted by most attorneys when a closing comes into effect. The commission's issue, in any commission's issue with a partial certificate, at that point, you're basically letting the developer off the hook. He now sells the house. You as the homeowner, you're now on the hook for whatever uh, whatever conditions that he was left to, uh, to resolve. So that's always been a sticking point, not only in Brockton, but in every conservation commission. So Brockton uh, came up with, with the idea that we put up a bond, that we place a bond, a cash bond uh, that would be held until Mr. Morrissey completed the work and in fact, uh, requested that final certificate of compliance. So that cash bond uh, would kind of hold his feet to the fire and and uh, and make sure that he would do it. Not that he wouldn't do it anyways. He's a wonderful, upstanding guy. But that's uh, that, that's the issue that we have with, uh, with conservation commissions and developers throughout the Commonwealth. So uh, so that was taken care of. So that that's a long history, Madam Chair, uh, on the on the project dating back four years now. 
so as I said, at this point, I think everything's been done. Uh, your agent had uh, visited the site a week ago and had a, a couple of things that he wanted done. He wanted the permanent markers uh, put in place that are now accepted by conservation. Previously, four years ago, those uh, metal markers really weren't being used. So Mr. Morrissey put in uh, pressure treated post and got some fancy signs uh, made up that said limit of work, no clearing. Uh, we got rid of those and added the, the conservation markers that you folks are currently uh, requiring on sites. Mr. Morrissey just finished putting those in uh, either yesterday or today. Uh, so that's been taken care of. And one other item that Kyle came up with was uh, the removal of the silt sort uh, that's typically placed at the limit of work. And uh, to be honest, in most cases, we, we usually leave the silt sock in place and just let it naturally uh, just kind of go away and blend in with the uh, with the environment. And it also just, you know, for the time that it takes to, to blend in, it kind of acts as a barrier just to make sure that people realize there's a wetland on the other side. Uh, Kyle still suggested that we at least look into removing the silt sock. Uh, when Mr. Morrissey attempted to do it, the uh, the silt sock itself is, as you guys know, is is full of mulch basically, and uh, the netting that holds it in. Uh, when we tried to remove it, the grass underneath had kind of woven itself into the fabric of the silt sock. So in order to actually remove the silt sock, Mr. Morrissey was ripping up all of the all of the ground around it and all of the vegetation uh, that they've been working so hard to to maintain and, and to get to flourish in that area. So at that point, uh, Mr. Morrissey reached out to the environmental company who in fact placed the silt sock on the property. And they said that the, uh, the silt sock is photodegradable, meaning that it, it breaks down with the sunlight. So it takes a little bit longer than the old fashioned biodegradable silt sock. Uh, it's being used a lot more now, just from a conservation point of view, it lasts longer. And uh, you guys kind of get a guarantee that it's going to remain in place and not deteriorate during construction. Uh, so their feeling is that you're better off just slitting the top of the uh, of this of the silt sock and just allowing nature to take its course, and it will in fact uh, photo degrade over a certain period of time. So that's where we stand with the uh, with Kyle's issue on that, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marcy. Uh, Anything to add as being part of the applicant's report? Yes, I can. I can update. I met with Kyle today. Um, showed him that the stakes, the old signs had been removed, um, the new markers had been installed, and by adding a, a, a second set of hands, we were able to carefully remove the entirety of the fabric. So the fabric is now removed. Um, and the mulch that remain in place is exactly where it was, where the silt sock was. So you you did replace you did remove the actual fabric of the. We silt got sock. the fabric out when we tried. When one guy tried it, it was very deeply rooted and entangled. But by adding a second set of hands and just kind of working it, we were able to remove the fabric in its entirety. Is that um? Do you know what the fabric is? Is it like a nylon? Say that again. A nylon? Do you know what the fabric is? It it um I would suppose it's a nylon. In speaking with uh Meadowbrook erosion controls, um they indicated that the product, as Scott said, was uh photo degradable um and it's intended to degrade slower uh, so as to maintain its purpose in separating a work area from an area that's um uh being preserved. Um, the mulch was fairly intact in it. And, um, uh, like I said, by adding a second set of hands, we were able to delicately remove it in its entirety without, um, any disruption. Mm -hmm. Which would mean then, then both conditions that were required then would be met. Um, Kyle, do you have any, anything that you might like to add? From your agent report, uh, uh, no, nothing to add. Um, but yes, I did meet on site with Jim today. Uh, everything looked good. Um, the silt sock had been removed as requested. Um, so uh, 
going to my agent report, my suggestion uh, here for the commission would be to uh, uh, recommend the commission vote to issue a complete certificate of compliance for both uh, 728 and uh, 744 in North Cary, but obviously those will have to be two separate uh, motions and votes. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, any questions at all? I did see in photos that there were like little wooden sticks, I guess that probably held the salt socks down. Are those actually still there or? Those have been removed. Thank you. Every Everything that Kyle's uh, requested be removed has been removed. So the stakes that held the sock, the fabric, um, the signs that I had originally placed uh, have been removed in their entirety and the uh, permanent markers have been installed. And we located all 15 of them um, during our on-site visit. Good, good. Thank you for your um, attention to detail. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, if there's no discussion, I entertain a motion then to issue a complete certificate of compliance first for 728 North Cary Street. I make a motion to issue a complete certificate of compliance for 728 North Cary Street. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Heekler, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Green, aye. Map, aye. And Boris, aye. Thank you. And I entertain a second motion, please, for 744 North Cary Street. Make a motion to issue a complete certificate of compliance to 744 North Cary Street. I second the motion. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay aye. Well. Oh, um, green aye. Map aye. And Boris aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a good evening. Good Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, I guess I just have one more comment, uh, Madam Chair, before I move on. Uh, concerning the bond that uh, Mr. Feria uh, spoke of, spoke of. So just just to let everyone know that the, the process here afterwards, after we issue this certificate, uh, the complete certificates of compliance for both of these properties, I will uh, write uh, a letter to the planning board, uh, and they're the ones that are going to be releasing the money. They were the ones that initially uh, requested that the treasurer uh, put that money away. So they are the only body that can that can release that. So uh, their next meeting is on December fifth. Um, so at that meeting, they will make a vote to release that bond and, and then that money can be uh, returned to the applicant. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good. I was amiss in, I, I forgot to mention at the very beginning of the meeting, which um, which cases have been, have been continued to the next meeting. Um, so in case there are any people that are here as, uh, as public, um, I'd like to just mention those very quickly. Um, the, the following cases have been continued to the next meeting. Uh, number 11, 549 Copeland Street. Number 12, 10 Peckham. Number 13, 166 East Ashland. Number 14, 339 Quincy. And number 15, 511 Thatcher. So those have all been continued to the December 13th meeting. Um, and also, I believe it was... Number nine, item number nine, it was a notice of intent on Churchill Avenue. That will not be heard this evening because of an issue with clerical error and the, the legal posting. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, I have one one last minute addition to that list. Two. Um, so uh, the RDA uh, application for 940 Belmont Street, uh, they have withdrawn that. So um, they are planning to uh, put a notice of intent in in the spring and they're just going to bundle the the delineation that they were pursuing with the RDA in with the notice of intent uh, in the springtime. Oh, good. So that's resource here. That's, uh, that's number eight. Uh, yeah, 940 Belmont Street. And that will be in the springtime? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll just make a note of that. Thank you. Well, that makes our meeting a little shorter. It, it really does. Thank you. Okay. Um... The next item on the agenda 
is an ANRAN for Zero Toby Road. Uh, do you have anyone here for that? Yes, uh, Evan Watson, I'm gonna promote you. If there's anyone else from the in the attendees panel uh, that needs to speak, please raise your hand. Hello, good evening. Hi, Evan. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, very good. Hello, is it W Engineering, I was in Watson? Yes, it is. How did you guess? <laughs> um, before we begin, I'd like to confirm that there is a DEP file number and abutters have been notified. Is that correct, Kyle? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wilson, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. It's Evan Watson, W Engineering, representing the applicant's uh, CLM development. Um, if you'd like, I could share my screen and I can put the... Um, plan up on the screen. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Let's see. Can we see the plan? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. So um, this is shown as zero Toby Road. It's actually a piece of property uh, to the east of North Quincy Street. Uh, this section of Toby Road is a uh, paper street is not developed. Um, it's essentially a paper road right now. Um, the locus comprised of two parcels, uh, one to the west of Toby Road and one to the east here. Um, Ken Thompson was the wetland scientist that delineated the property and he had a comprehensive report um, attached with our application. So he reviewed this section here um, I'm displaying the LiDAR topography at two foot contours. So you can see we're relatively uh, high on this side and all, all the topography flows uh, this way. Uh, in the middle of our site, more or less in the middle, there is a existing utility easement. And then there is a, um, a wetland here in the valley. I also think that there is a, um, a sewer easement that runs within this as well to the city of Brockton all the way, and then we basically come up a little bit to a, a ridge here, and then it comes back down. Um, he delineated a, a top of bank here. There is a river shown on the USGS, so that was delineated. Um, I will make the comment that I, I think I self, uh, did not correctly indicate the riverfront here. I, I did put a 200 riverfront, which uh, I believe in the city of Brockton, it's, it's just a 50 foot riverfront, so I'll have to change that on the plan. Um, so there's a little wetland here that flows this way. Again, it's, it's all towards the back of the property. And then lastly, we have the D line. Um, and there is a low lying spot here and there's been some, uh, work. I don't know. must've been when these, uh, home sites were built that has a, a little ditch that directs it into the, um, utility easement area and where it, it essentially disappears or infiltrates into the ground. Um, so we did get a DEP file number. Um, DEP's comments mentioned that if there is a ditch within this, it would constitute a intermittent stream. Um, so we are not, uh, we're agreeing that with that. We're not classifying this as an isolated wetland. Uh, if it borders on the ditch, then it's a, a BVW. Uh, so we did show a hundred foot buffer zone there. Um, on the plan, we show the soil types. We show the 100 foot buffer zones, uh, 50 and 25 foot as required by our um, application requirements. Um, and I think Kyle had a few comments. I'll let him speak to his comments. But as far as I understand, it was just to um, demonstrate that we've, in fact, uh, notified of butters. So I, I ordered you that information uh, yesterday and that um, he was recommending that beta be contacted to um, review the delineation. Mm -hmm. And you're agreeable to that, Mr. Watson? Yes. Um, my only comment to that is if they are going to go out on the site, um, the applicant asked me if um, our wetland scientists could be present during the time of their site walk. 
so that we could get um, all eyes out on there and be transparent and then we can get everything um, adjusted if there needs to be any adjustments right there on one field site visit. Mm -hmm. Sounds fair to me. Thank you. Um, Kyle, do you have any um, additions or suggestions, recommendations? Uh, yeah, just one quick thing. Um, Evan, uh, Brockton has a 25 foot riverfront area. So instead of a okay. 50, so just make, make that note and you can make that adjustment. Uh, not, not a big deal, but just wanted to let you know. Um, and as Mr. Watson uh, said, yes, I'm recommending that the commission, uh, you know, uh, request that beta come out here and uh, uh, confirm the delineation for this project. Which therefore would just recommend, recommend we'd have to recommend a continuance to next month. Or how uh, yeah, yep. Um, so we probably would want to vote on having Beta do this uh, delineation, and then we would just continue to the to the next meeting. Yep. Um, commissioners, any questions at all? I have a question. Please do. Um, what is uh, the proposed use for the land? Right now. Um, Proposed use, um, we're delineating the wetlands, and then once we get that established, then he was going to look into what types of uses uh, could be used. So at this point in time, there is no proposed use. Proposed use. Yeah, and that's how like this. So this is an anorad filing, and so with an anorad, uh, it, it's singularly just looking at the the wetland lines, and, and we're just confirming the resource areas. That's that's all of this this filing type uh, ever involves. So after they uh, get these lines uh, confirmed and, and the commission is comfortable with beta's uh, comments, um, then the applicant can take that plan. It's valid for three years and then they can develop some sort of development there. And then that would have to come back before the commission to be approved. Any 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 actual development would have to be approved through the like a notice of intent filing. But Peggy, I do believe that many times developers have an idea. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, yeah, and I'm sure they do, but they're not required to to make that part of this filing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Any other commission questions? Comments? I just wish I could see like the the it's difficult to see the the, the lines. Of, you know that the um, actual values that are on the lines of the um what is it called the topographical lines it's hard to see what hard yeah, to see what yeah, the I can, sure i can everything. talk to it a little bit i'll zoom in yeah so, be... yeah up at the top up by um north quincy street we're at a highest elevation of 206 right it's a little bit above the road which is around 200. yeah when we get to the other parcel, we step down to about 188. Oh. Then we come down, when we get into this wetland, we're approximately 166 or so. Yeah. One... Um, comes back up to a, another ridge at 172. Mm -hmm. Then down into this valley, we're at 150. Um, again, back up to about 160 at this ridge here. And then when it comes down all the way in the back, we're about 132. So from the front to the back, there's over 70 feet of, of relief across the whole thing. And also, do you know what the what the uh, identity is of the river? This river is an unnamed tributary to, it's in the report that uh, Ken put together. Oh, it's Beaver. It eventually becomes the beaver something or other brook. I'm sorry. I don't know what's yeah, I think over it's there. the beaver brook, yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Okay. But this is not the beaver brook. This is just a channel that runs through the wetlands that eventually goes to the beaver brook. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's yeah. So if you need a request, uh, you know, if, if you guys are looking to uh, have beta go out there, hopefully with the uh, Mr. Thompson, I'd request a continuance to the next hearing with a date uh, assured. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioners, entertain a vote to, I mean, I entertain a motion rather to continue this to the next meeting with the request that Mr. Thompson and Beta both are um, able to do the site walk together. Is that, I'm not sure exactly how to word that or. Yes, that, that's, that's right. Okay. make a motion to continue um zero toby road to the next meeting on it's the next meeting's date Hold december on. 13th december 13th 2023 um so that the site can be reviewed by what was just suggested by those who were just suggested i second the motion so the motion's been made and seconded to continue um zero toby road after a meeting with Beta, um, till the next meeting on October thirteenth. Roll call. Uh, excuse me, Madam Chairman. Was there any um, public input? Do we need to? Oh, I'm. Uh, of course, with an Android must. Of course. Yeah. If, yeah. Sorry. Don't want to blow it. <laughs> absolutely. Is there anyone here in attendance? I, I see one hand raised. Uh, Jack Lally. I will be promoting Jack. Mr. Watson. I'm sorry. And uh, another one. Here we go. Mr. Bois? Yeah, I've, I've promoted both. Okay, Mr. Lally, I believe you had your hand up first. I'll take it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi. All right. Commissioners, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to, you know, highlight some of the, uh, you know, the the sentiments of of the abutters of the constituents. So I'm I'm Jack Valley. I'm the Ward Six City Councilor. I represent the area. Um, I of course am joined by uh, State Representative Michelle Dubois, my colleague and counterpart in the State House. Um, they there's just you know, and I wanted to just start off by saying the way this you know was rolled out, there were a, a lot of questions. There was a lot of confusion. Um, the, uh, I've got at least one, uh, a butter I can, I can offline talk to, talk to you, Madam Chair, or, or you, Mr. Holden, um, that did not receive notification, uh, and the notification that was received, I don't know if it meets the, um, standards for the commission. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a little vague and it didn't really represent too much. Um, the other thing just is the the confusion. So I understand from Mr. Watson that there is no project in place. Um, and I do appreciate, uh, you know, the, the way that uh, that was that was explained and laid out. Um, but still, the the entire process left uh, quite a bit of um you know, confusion, a little bit of stress. It was it was up in the air for folks, uh, and we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what was uh, what was happening, what was going on with it. Um, I think that you know this is an ANRAD is pretty uh, straightforward. I I don't really know if there's any any grounds to interrupt that, so I'm not going to make that uh, kind of uh, suggestion. Uh, but I do request that going forward, um, anything that, that comes up for, for conversation, uh, I would place a, a high premium on uh, properly including and notifying the neighborhood so as not to cause the level of uh, stress that has, has been put on, you know, the folks nearby. Um, but I appreciate that and I will hand the floor through you, Madam Chair, to my my counterpart in the State House. But thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Lally. So, so if I hear you properly, there was some confusion about this particular ANRAD and anything going forward. It when there is some plan in place and an NOI is put forward, I would expect that it, it would be much clearer in the notification. Correct? That's what you would prefer. That there would be a clear understanding um, that would go to the abutters regarding yeah. what. Was going to be I'll, I will I will reach out uh, off offline separately um, about uh, I to the the owner of the property or to you Mr. Watson if you'd prefer about uh, some kind of hopefully setting something up 
if something goes forward um, for the for the neighborhood, uh, which I think usually uh, makes things makes things easier. But I do appreciate the commission's time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Wall, hello. Mr. Wall. Hello. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, sorry, I just I just received a text from Representative Dubois. Uh, she is not quite confident that this that her Zoom is going to work. Uh, she's in the state house. They're they're having some voting, uh, and they're probably going late into the night. Um, her request was also uh, you know, greater explanation of of uh of what is intended to be you know, done with the property. Um, I will speak with the representative uh, once she's available and, and out of uh, the state house and fill her in as to the happenings of this meeting. But she uh, she does express the, the sentiment that I already laid out. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Yep. And just to be clear, an AMRAD is simply a, a fact-finding mission, I think, to determine what exactly could be done with that property, I believe. Potentially. Okay, so I believe we were ready to entertain a motion. Is that correct? Or unless any commissioners, if you have any other questions or anything as a result of the public input. If not, I'll entertain a vote then to continue. Did we do the vote to continue? We no, we were midway through the motion. motion. Okay. The motion was made. Was it seconded? It, it was. was seconded, yes. I'm sorry. So now we just need to uh, to have a roll call vote. Thank you. Equal aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Green aye. Map aye. Boris aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you, uh, it's the, the 13th, you said? Right. Right. It's a week before we normally would meet, but because of the holidays. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank good you. night. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Hey, thank you, Mr. Lally. Next item on the agenda is um, an RDA. Uh, and that is a request for determination of applicability uh, for 51 Parkview Lane. A project is the tree, tree removal. Is anyone here to speak to that as an applicant? Yeah, I promoted the homeowner, uh, Lauren. Is anyone else present as well? No, it's just me. Okay. Hi, Ms. Wart. How are you? Hi, I'm well. How are you? Hi, thank you. If you could give us a little screen, that would be lovely. Um, sure. So um, the reason that I'm here tonight is we have a few trees that are um, just beyond our property line, um, but abutting some conservation land. I'm sorry, some wetlands. Um, so we're just looking, um, we had filed the RDA to see if it was reasonable for us to have those taken down. Um, we did receive, we had them looked at by, um, a tree company, Walnut Tree Service, um, just kind of asking what their recommendation would be. Cause we had a lot of trees, um, throughout storms throughout the years fall down in that area. Um, one particularly on our neighbor's fence. Others luckily kind of fell the other direction, um, but some were uprooted. So it just kind of made us nervous. There's a few um, large ones that um, in particular. You're freezing. Sorry. Ms. Dwart, I can't hear you. Ms. Dwart? No. Now I can hear you. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what's going on. Can you hear me now? It's breaking up, but I can hear you right this moment. Uh, okay. What's the last thing that you heard me say? Uh, property. <laughs> Neighbors. Oh. <fence. laughs> yeah. Also, I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. I know everybody. 
<laughs> it's, it's getting late for everybody. But um, basically, we have these three trees that are large. They're close to our property line. They're not actually on our property line, but we do have permission from the landowner to take it down, take them down um, if, you know, it's okay with the um, Conservation Commission. So um, we did receive a letter from... Um, Walnut Tree Services, uh, the the CEO that um, he had, he was the one that kind of looked at the the property and had made the recommendations of the few trees that were, um, the most dangerous or the mo the ones that were most likely to cause problems for us, um, and recommended that those come down. So those were the I'm not sure if you had heard it was a white oak, a, um, a hickory tree and a white pine tree, um. So that's what I'm here for today. Okay, thank you. Um, Kyle? Yeah, sure, uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, I've got some photos that I can share real quick just so the commission kind of see what we're talking about here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I went out, um, well, I've been out to the site a couple of times, but most recently was on the, the 9th um, last week. Um, so the three trees in question, are you guys able to see this photo? Mm -hmm. so this is from the, uh, as Lauren said, um, the, the property in question 51 uh, Parkview is, is this house in the middle of the frame. Um, so I'm in the uh, the land, uh, the parcel behind that. I think it's to the south. Um, and this is owned by Risk Takers LLC, this this parcel. And as uh, 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 Lauren said, they, they do have permission from the uh, the owner of this property to do uh, whatever tree removal uh, is is permitted by the commission. So uh, they have approval to do kind of whatever they, you know, whatever we deem uh, appropriate. Um, the three trees in question, um, I, I went out there and I kind of flagged them uh, with, with this orange tape. So uh, the one over to the left side of the frame is the white pine. The one in the middle of the frame closest to the camera is the uh, the oak, the white oak. And then the one all the way to the right is the hickory. Um, I'm going to move to another photo. So these are the same three trees and they are, are all relatively large. So uh, we're at the where I'm looking, basically I'm on the, the patio of the, the house looking back at that, that area now. Uh, the white pine is here to the right. Um, in the center of the frame is the oak and then the hickory is here to the left. So all three of these trees are very large. Um, and, uh, you know, and if they were to fall, they, they could reach certainly into the yard, um, potentially damaging the fence. The, uh, there's, a, there's a play area there. Uh, there's a pool in the backyard, a patio, uh, and then obviously the structure itself, the, the home. Um, <clears throat> so uh, those are the three trees in question. Um, so when I spoke to uh, the representative from Walnut Tree Service, which is also the company that would be doing the work here, they've, they've done a site visit over the summer. Um, and, you know, they uh, advised that the uh, the applicant, the homeowner, uh, contact us because there are wetland resource areas back in, in that area um, just to kind of be safe and make sure that we're doing everything above board. So um, when I was out there, um, I did identify wetland plants, uh, but I didn't do a, a formal delineation. Um, the uh, I tried to dig, dig some pits uh, to, to check the soils, and uh, it is very rocky uh, throughout that whole area. Um, there's a very uh, sharp um, kind of drop off from uh, the area that all three of these trees are kind of in to where the wetland is. There's maybe a three to four foot uh, like drop. So it's it's very apparent that they aren't in the actual resource area, but they are certainly within buffer zone. So that's kind of where we are with the uh, the wetland resource areas. Um, following my discussion with the uh, uh, the representative from Walnut Tree Service, uh, his concerns were that a uh, the being a, a rocky soil um, and it being a wet area back there that the the roots of these three trees uh, aren't likely very deep uh, meaning that they could easily topple over um, with a shallow root system so th that's that's th the main concern um, two of the trees are kind of leaning towards the property that being the white oak uh, all the way here to the right of the frame and then the hickory uh, yes. is leaning slightly towards the property. The, the white oak is dramatically leaning over the property line. Um, yeah. In my opinion, the, the white oak is, is clearly uh, a, a problem uh, and, and should definitely be removed. Um, oh, we got a hand up. Sorry, Joyce. Uh, I think you meant white pine, right? Not white oak. Yes, I did. So, uh, the, sorry. Yes, the white pine is the one that's leaning dramatically over the property line um, and, and is just clearly, if it were to fall, it would, it would almost certainly fall uh, towards the property. 
the hickory here all the way to the left is is uh, is slightly leaning. It's kind of has a little bit of preferential growth towards the property, uh, meaning that you know if it were to fall, uh, maybe. But but it is leaning slightly towards the property. So I've also recommended that that one be allowed to be removed. Uh, finally, the, the the tree in the middle, uh, which is the white oak. Um, I did not really when I was out there. I didn't didn't observe any any preferential growth in any direction. It's not really leaning in any given direction either. Um, now I recognize the fact that you know it, it likely has the same shallow root system as the other two trees. Um, so, but in my report, um, I did not recommend uh, that the commission uh, allow that tree to be removed. And the reason that I had for that is because um, you know there are just a lot of uncertainties here, and it doesn't pose a, a clear threat to the property. Um, you know, uh, the tree would obviously have to fall. It would have to fall towards the property. Um, to really cause any damage. And, and like my point to the commission is like you are tasked with, um, you know, safeguarding the interests of the, the Wetland Protection Act, which would be the wetland area behind this property. And we've got to kind of balance the, the interest of protecting that resource area and the interest of public safety and, you know, obviously development, which is mostly what we deal with here. So um, this is obviously up to the commission. You are all, you know, able to make this decision how you want. Um, but my recommendation was to allow the, the two trees to be removed. Uh, the third tree, um, I'm not recommending uh, to be removed at this time, um, but I am open to if we want to um, dig a little bit deeper into this, we, we, we certainly can. One thing that I suggest that if we want to consider removal of the of the white oak is maybe get an arborist out to, to assess the, the health of the tree and to look at the root system specifically um, rather than uh, a representative from the tree removal company. So that's kind of my spiel. Um, I'm open for any questions or Lauren, if you have any comments or questions, uh, please feel free to, well, through the chair, of course, Madam, uh, to have a response. Mr. Stewart, do you have anything else to add before we open it up to the commissioners? You have to, oops, yep. I'm sorry, Can you? if you can hear me now, I, I'm i not yep. too, I'm not, I don't do a lot of Zoom, I have <laughs> um, so no, I um thank you so much for for hearing all of this and for um you know for listening. I do um I do understand where 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 Kyle's coming from um just you know regarding the uncertainty and that of course the commission has a responsibility to do what's best for the wetlands. I just um you know I just if you can consider allowing us to do all those three trees just regarding the uncertainty. Of course, there's uncertainty that it's going to fall. Um, but considering the risk, considering my home, considering my family, um, it's just a little hard to live with that uncertainty. Um, and there's also a cost involved. Um, the last thing I want to do is remove what the, or remove any vegetation that we don't have to. I, I purchased the property knowing that that was wetlands back there and that, you know, it would likely never be built on. I love having the, I have a, you know, nice open fence so I can see that I like having that back there. So I'm, I'm not trying to ask for anything unreasonable, but just considering the cost, because it is going to be a cost incurred to my family. It's not, the risk takers is not covering the cost of any of this. Um, this is something that we're, we're covering ourselves and, and have this done twice or have, you know, I, I, you know, in the future, or if it does fall and then the cost of having to, um, take, um, you know, take care of that, and any damage to the property, um, you know, it just it just poses a bit of an, an anxiety and a hardship. And, and I know that's not what it's about, but um, just, you know, just, just, you know, Madam Chair, just something to consider if, um, if you would to um, just kind of let this, let this be done. But um, again, this is the first time I've ever done this. So I'm not, I'm not sure what else I guess to, um, <laughs> what else to say or, 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 or how, how else to argue it. Um, but um, anyway, that's I think that's all that I have left to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My understanding, Kyle, if you could correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that an RDAA is a request for determination of applicability, which basically is saying, is this really under the jurisdiction of the Wetlands Protection Act or not? And so if we issue a negative determination, then the applicant is free to do what they must, as long as everything, you know, you don't bring heavy equipment into the areas that are, that are, you know, resource areas or anything. Or if you 
say, a, if there's positive determination made, that would mean that it would be under the jurisdiction of the Wetlands Protection Act and therefore would have to actually undergo a little bit more detailed application process. Is Am I incorrect about that or? Broadly speaking, that's correct. <clears throat> now, now there's a lot more nuance there. The, the form does have multiple like positive, multiple types of positive determinations and multiple types of negative determinations. Um, so what, you know, what we could do in this example would be, um, I don't have the number in front of me, but there's a certain determination that basically says the commission would be saying uh, that, yes, this, uh, this work that's being proposed is in a jurisdictional area, but it won't have a negative impact on the resource area itself. Therefore, we can allow the work. And that's kind of, you know, if the commission were to approve the, this tree removal, that's the kind of the the way that we would we would go. So I, I don't have that number in front of me currently, but but I can dig for, for that if you're wanting to approve all three of these trees removed currently, or just two. We can you you can dictate what what you want, but we can uh, we we can we can do this through an RDA. It's not always just whether this is going to be completely uh, outside of jurisdiction or you need to file an RDA, uh, a notice of intent. There, there is some some room within an RDA to allow work to uh, to proceed, but then also give uh, kind of like special conditions like we do for full notice of intent, but obviously not to that extent. So um, there is some wiggle room here. I was looking on the website today, on the city website actually, for it to try to find out those, those details and I couldn't seem to find it. So I, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but maybe we can make that available to us for future RDA discussions to have. Yeah, certainly we can have that discussion you know, yep. outside of this meeting. Yep. Sure. Um, commissioners, questions, comments? I think because of all the cost incurred um, to take these down and being the homeowner and having to do that, I would almost lean towards doing it in a sense that knowing how the commission generally goes towards airs towards a lot of conservative approaches to things. I would almost say if we could have an arborist come out to determine the third tree that's of question, because it would just be terrible if we said two, and then the owner goes to all that expense and then turns around and has to do something again. That just doesn't make any logical sense to me. So I would, just knowing how the commission usually votes very much on the side of conservative, I would say that I would that's my personal suggestion, just to get the health of the tree from somebody that's an arborist. I think that would be smart. And then that way we're not wasting you know, time and energy and sometimes months at a time to get things approved and then say there is a bad storm and something happens and it could have been avoided, especially since she has a family and everything. So that's just my two cents. Sounds reasonable. I agree. And there have been a lot of oak tree oak tree uprootings um i would say within the past few years as things are wetter um so mr wart sorry um yes uh that i mean that sounds that sounds that sounds good do i is it okay if i ask the tree company if they know somebody or does it have to be a third party like does it have to be a certain um i could say an arborist separate from the tree company would be, you know, to avoid conflict of interest. Sure. Would, yeah. If you, so perhaps you could come back next month and let us know what the, what that determination is. And at that time. Okay. Sure. Would be reasonable. Okay. Okay. So I don't believe we need a, do we need a motion for that? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll just want to continue this to the next next month, um, and the applicant will be responsible for contacting the arborist and then providing uh, that information to the commission. Okay. I don't think you need a motion to to require that an arborist. No, no. You know, give us input. Just I think we just we can just continue with that understanding. Okay. So we do need a motion. A motion, motion to continue. Yeah. Motion to continue, please. I make a motion to continue 51 Parkview Lane till December 13th meeting um, for an update on obtaining an arborist opinion. Mm -hmm. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded to continue 51 Park Lane tree removal to the December 13th meeting. 
with a, a report from an arborist. Okay, roll call vote, please. B. Clare, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Green, aye. Matt, aye. Boris, aye. That motion passes. We'll see you next month, Ms. Dwyer. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, the next um, item on the agenda is an RDA for Massasoit Boulevard, number one Massasoit Boulevard, removal and replacement of a fuel tank system. Is anyone here for the applicant? Niche yes, I've got one. I'm going to promote Bill. Oh, I think you're muted, Bill. Well, my apologies. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Hi. My name is uh, Bill Ma with uh, Niche Engineering, and um, we are requesting a negative determination of applicability for a project located at Massasoit Community College, located at 1 Massasoit Soit Boulevard in, uh, in Brockton. Um, the location of this site is at the public facilities uh, building, uh, which is at lot four on the, the campus. And Kyle, um, could you pull up any drawings? Um, uh, yeah, I can. Give me one moment. I'll, I'll get that pulled up for you. You can continue to speak as I do that. Sure. And um, what we are proposing uh, you know, to do on the side of the facilities building, um, specifically on the eastern side of the facilities building, is an existing uh, gas pump um, with two underground tanks, uh, concrete pad, and associated piping. And what the um, college is looking to do is to remove this um, these items. Um, and I don't know if you can zoom in on over to the uh, left there, Kyle, please. Okay, thank you. How's that? Is that all right? Yes, thank you. So, um, you know, just about in the middle of the uh, you know page there, next to the uh, um, existing facilities building, uh, the associated uh, gas pump um, and two underground um, gasoline tanks. Um, both tanks are located outside of the hundred foot buffer zone. The um, gas pump um, and concrete pad. Uh, within the 100 foot buffer zone of the uh, you know, wetlands. And what we are proposing to do is to remove those items, uh, you know, backfill it with clean material, um, pave over it, and um, relocate the, the system um, farther away from the, um, from the wetland line there. Um, you know, this is a, a grass island. Um, right now in between some parking spaces and we're looking to convert just a portion of this for the location of above ground tanks uh, that are double walled, um, have an alarm system and uh, you know so forth um, you know, for the for the new tanks. Um, they will be surrounded with bollards uh, just to protect it from any uh, you know vehicles, plows, uh, you know things of that nature. Um, just a little history on the the previous, um, discussion there about the existing tanks. The, those tanks have been um, in that location for approximately 30 years. The tanks that were there before were removed in 1993 and um, approximately 30 yards of contaminated soil um, was found. It was reported to DEP um, and a cleanup you know, was done on the site there. So, um, and as I had sent Kyle some of the um, certificates that um, Massasoit has re um, received um, over the past um, few years, um, you know, there have been no instances of any releases or things of that nature. We do have monitoring wells and they have not found um, any um, signs of contaminated water, soil, um, you know, things of that nature. We do have an LSP on site, Atlas from Woburn who will be overseeing this project. I'm sorry, um, LSP? License uh, safety? 
Um, uh, sorry, Joyce. An LSP. Yes. Licensed safety professional. Is that what that's? What does that stand for? It, 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 it's a licensed site professional. Professional. Okay. Thank you. It, um, they um, will be in charge of handling any dirty soils, um, you know, things of that nature, um, you know, on the on the site there. And um, if something is found, it will be reported. But um, all indications are right now that they have not found um, a single, um, you know, item. Um, what we're proposing to do for some erosion controls is um, there are some catch basins nearby, and we're going to put some silt sacks, um, you know, in them to prevent any um, possibility of water or material from flowing into the uh, storm drain systems. Um, this location is approximately at a low point, um, going towards a plan north of the site towards the blue line where the, the wetlands are, is at a higher elevation, approximately one and a half to, to two feet higher um, all along there. So um, there will be no direct uh, you know, discharge of um, any you know, materials uh, you know, into the, the wetlands, but we do have uh, an erosion control barrier along the edge of the um, parking lot, um, you know, plan north and northwest and uh, so forth, yes. Um, no, we can. I, I did receive it, um, Kyle's letter yesterday, um, and um, we can provide some additional um, erosion controls. But as noted on our plans, that the contractor is required to provide additional erosion controls, you know, on the site and to adjust them accordingly based on his um, use of the site and um, his activities on the site. Um, it's really hard at this point in time to uh, say how he's going to um, attack things because most of this they want to keep um, up and running um, the existing uh, gas pump system until this new one, new one is online and then remove the, the old system at that point. So the, the new one will be, will be um, put online first before the old one is removed, is that correct? Correct, because the, the the college does use it for their vehicles and you know so forth. And if that was removed first, then um, it would kind of create a, a bit of a hardship as to where they're going to get their gasoline when they don't have outside cards, things of that nature. Of course, uh, to purchase like the the um, gasoline. Do you have a, a an area on on this plan that shows where, as you're excavating the soil, for Oh no, it's going to be an above ground installation, isn't it? Yes. So just a little bit of, of excavation for the concrete pad, is that it? Yeah, correct. You know, going down about 12 inches or so, um, you know, for, for the pad. And then um we're running conduit. Um obviously because they are steel walled, um, double walled um tanks, we need to run um, an electrical line um from each tank, um, basically the alarm system and so forth. And to, and to run the pump systems, um, you know, back to the building. And that will be approximately, at, you know, two to two and a half feet deep. Mm -hmm. the, the conduit will be encased in concrete just because it is a, uh, a traveled area um, parking lot and so forth, so that none of those um, pipes are crushed during any um, sort of operation on the site. We, we were before the commission four years ago um, for this site um, when we uh, repaid the, the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we did request a, um, and received a negative determination um, for, for the parking lot as well, for the reconstruction of it. Mm -hmm. All right, and if I could, and I'm sorry, if I could just say one more thing is that um, we are installing, um, hoods over the existing outfall pipe from each of the, the catch basins um, uh, in this um, area of the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, so uh, the catch basins, if you don't mind me interrupting, Bill, excuse me, um, uh, are marked on the map as these circles with the hash through them. So there are, yes. I think believe there are seven uh, scattered throughout the parking lot. Um, this one here is the only one that's within the buffer zone. Um, I'm going to 
scroll down. Oh, I guess it's not on this plan. Uh, the the other plan that was provided by the applicant has the 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 specs for the hood. Uh, so what that looks like coming out, uh, uh, you know, covering the outflow pipe. Yeah, correct. Um, Kyle, your report, sir. Oh uh, yeah, sure. I've just got um just a few questions, and, and Bill's already answered a, a few of these things. So um. You know, I recognize the fact that most of this proposed work is outside of the, that jurisdictional 100 foot buffer zone. Um, but I was just concerned about uh, a, a few things um, that some of them have already been addressed. So I guess uh, let's start with the hood since we were just speaking over that. Um, Bill, what's what's the installation of that of that hood look like? Is that just something that someone can open up that uh, uh, the manhole and, and get down in there and install the hood? Or is there going to be any excavation uh, with the installation of these hoods? Nope, there's no excavation. Um, it's typically they just pull the grate off of the um, catch basin and then it just insert the, the pipe you know, over it. it it's a uh, plastic insert and it just fits right over the pipe. So there is no excavation. Okay, uh, if... great, thank you. Um, here on this map, uh, <clears throat> I believe this is an elevation here at 104.57, is that correct? Correct. Is that uh, is that the is that the, the elevation of the of the parking lot in that in that area? Or I, uh, I can't yeah. tell what that's actually pointing to. If that's pointing to this line here or what? Yeah, yeah there there were some uh, you know features that were there um, previously, Kyle. Uh -huh. um, pre previously, uh, when we appeared before the commission four years ago, um, at that time, Massasoit had its salt shed, um, trailers, containers, um, you know, things of that nature. And um, so, you know, some of this is from, uh, you know, that time, um, you know. Okay, back so I, I guess my concern was looking at the uh, the elevations uh, throughout the rest of the parking lot, you know, we have 105 through here, 106 all the way over here on this portion, uh, 105 here again. Uh, the elevation here of these, uh, I think these are the access manholes above the tanks uh, are 104.71. So one of my concerns was <clears throat> 104.57 is less than 104.71. So I was concerned about, you know, sheet flow potentially uh, running, you know, if we do uh, excavation um, and there is exposed soils here and, you know, I know you you had clean reports, but if there was some sort of uh, contamination that that could potentially be an issue. I know we have erosion controls over here on this corner. Um, but I just wasn't sure if that 104.57 was was the 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 elevation uh, of of the parking lot back there. No, no there's there's a ridge line. Um, you know, there's it might be you know 104. Point, you know, seven down by the um, tanks, but it does rise up to about 105.2 or so. Um, you know, and it runs um, south to north um, all the way out along the area, you know, because you can see, you know, some of these other grades, you know, out there, 105, 35, 55, 60, um, you know, so forth. So it's, it's getting you know, almost like a little bit of a, a crest of a, of a hill there where, um, you know, in this portion of the, of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, then obviously one of my big concerns was, if there was soil contamination here. And uh, as Bill mentioned before, he did submit, uh, you know, documents uh, going back to, I think maybe 2015 uh, that basically show that, you know, they are in compliance with the, the underground storage tank program that's that's run through the state. Um, I am unfamiliar with that program. So I sent an email out uh, to, you know, the program last week. Uh, I just heard back from them yesterday and I had a discussion uh, with one of the representatives there and uh, she confirmed that, that the documents that were provided to the commission uh, all look to be good. Um, so there were two different documents that were provided. Uh, one was a self-reported uh, kind of monitoring check. Uh, and then uh, there was also a, a third party um, comfort kind of, you know, inspection confirmation um, that happens uh, at different times. And these are kind of staggered. I think they're each uh, are, are scheduled to be three years apart. So you'll have, um, you know, 
the 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 self-reported inspection then like a year and a half later you'll have the third party inspection and then the the self-reported inspection is my understanding of how that goes um i was also uh uh confirmed to me when i was speaking to this person from the the program that they have uh their own standards in place for the removal uh, of these tanks um that require monitoring actively uh when the tanks are being removed um so that was one of the concerns that i had i didn't know that that those uh those regulations were in place um, but but there are uh, regulations from the state uh, that you know the applicant will have to abide by as they are removing those tanks. So that those are kind of like the big concerns that I have. I guess Bill, I've got one more question about this plan. Um, so I'm going to scroll down here and kind of look at the. Uh, so as I kind of mentioned before, uh, these kind of circles with the hash through them, those are the uh, like the the grates, uh, basically drainage grates that are that are currently at the parking lot. These are all connected into one system. Is that correct here with, with these drain lines? Is that right? Yeah, correct. And in, in those um, circles um, that are cross-hatched, um, Kyle and um, board members, um, those delineate the um, installation of erosion control devices like silk sacks, um, wattles, um, straw bales, um, you know, things of that nature over those um, you know, catch basins to protect, to protect any uh, inflow or foreign inflow for, for that matter into um, the structures and eventually into the storm drain system and out to the wetlands. So it does So uh, Thank you. And that was my follow question. So there, there's, it, it, so they're all connected here uh, underneath uh, with this line kind of coming across and then there's an outflow here. And, and that was my kind of my, I guess my final question was, uh, is that connected to a, a stormwater system that 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 goes out and you know connects to another pipe, or um, I'm going to scroll up here. Uh, this blue line is the wetland line, and this uh, vertical line here is is the the outflow. Um, so I wasn't sure where that went. So that does outflow into the wetland. Good, yeah, correct. Okay. Not and, 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 system in the city of Brockton. I'm not sewage. I mean, to the stormwater system in Brockton. No, uh, no. This this. There's a, a channel, swale, um, what have you, out and back here that's basically parallel with this, you uh, know, blue line, right? Um, that that has been there since the uh, the college was constructed back in the late '60s, early '70s. So um, that that's a retention basin. No, uh, no, but I, I think it goes into you know um, a, a wetland area that's um, far to the um, north of this or far to the east of the site because hmm. there's i believe there's a culvert that um goes underneath the, the roadway entrance exit from um is it crescent street or center street um you know into the um campus so kyle are you concerned about the possibility of Gasoline from that new area, from from that kind of um, contamination, or contamination from construction. Mostly, well, I mean, obviously, if there's a spill uh, after the whole process is done, that's problematic. But that's also true currently before this project, you know, occurs. Right? They already have an active gas pump here that's that's been in place for years, as Bill has said here. And there's a there's an you know a, a drainage area right here. So you know, is that going to be much different uh, if we allow this project versus how it currently is? You know, probably not much different. I mean, obviously, spill is bad. There is a drainage area right next to that over here. Um, my my main concern here, though, is um, I wasn't sure where this uh, this this catch basin system uh, where the outlet went. If it was connected to a larger pipe system or if that drained into the wetland. So. Even though that this area is outside of the the jurisdictional buffer zone, uh, there is a a point source you know uh, outlet that goes directly into the wetland that collects water from this entire area. So, you know, my argument, and I'm and I'm not sure on this because I didn't know this until just now, but but I'm I'm, I'm kind of thinking that that may increase the area of jurisdiction for the conservation commission to include a larger portion of the parking lot. Uh, because any area that drains into these uh, these uh, you know, catch basins uh, ultimately gets 
directly deposited without any treatment into the wetland. So I'm not sure about that, but that's something that I would like to look into more. Um, and that's kind of where I am uh, on, on this project. I, Bill, I appreciate you coming to the meeting tonight and kind of explaining uh, the, the plan to us a little bit more. You've answered some of my questions, uh, but I still have some concerns here. I, I think that the big concern is, uh, you know, soil contamination, but I think that 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 it's already handled by the the underground storage tank uh, program, and they're going to be monitoring that. But then, just broadly speaking, um, I'm not convinced that that this project should be getting a negative determination. Uh, basically, and I will read you what the negative determination uh, states. So this is kind of what um, uh, what Bill is hoping that the commission uh, uh, you know uh, votes on. Uh, uh, negative determination, I, I think Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but negative, determ negative determination three, which reads, the work described in the request is within buffer zone as, as described is defined in the regulations, but will not alter an area subject to jurisdiction under the act. Therefore, said work does not require the filing of notice of intent subject to the following conditions, if any. So that, this is one that allows you to put a few conditions in, and we may still be able to do that, but I'm not, I'm not comfortable now giving that recommendation because I, you know, I'm just looking at this kind of with the commission here. So my recommendation at this point would be um, that we continue this to next month, uh, allow us all to kind of digest this a little bit. I can do a little bit more digging and, um, you know, and then we can we can kind of go from there. Um, that's kind of my thought. How could we request please that you might do a site visit? Yeah, I've, I've been out there before. I, I can, and, and, and the commission members, you're also all welcome, you know, at any point to, to, to go to these sites. Mm -hmm with the commit with with the agent or without but if you guys are interested in seeing this we can also go out there together yes mr mayor mr mayor could we arrange to do that perhaps one time before the next meeting yes I I mean, if, a, if, a, if, a if, if I, i'm sorry go ahead peggy my um question was why are you moving the tanks um I'm, I'm sorry, you, you cut out there a little bit. Um, um, why, why are you moving the tanks from where they are to the new place? Well, it, it's just a, it's an old system. It's not, uh, you know, it's it's 30 years old. Um, you know, they like to get with the times and, um, you know, replace it. You know, they find that um, at, at times it's not functional. It doesn't um, read the... Um, the cards correctly and so forth. So they they would like to have a a new card system, um, you know, in place, you know, for people who are um, accessing these um, you know pumps. You know, I I won't say you know for um, you know any crime or things of that nature, but you know it's just um, it's more of a uh, up to date uh, enhancement of their um, system. And go. then as a follow-up, why did you choose the area that it's going to be placed in? Well, th that was uh, the most, you know, reasonable, uh, you know, area, uh, you know, considering what the um, facilities, um, you know, in the in the campus, you know, uses, you know, on the site. We couldn't go to the other side of the building, um, you know, just because we're, we're in a uh, wetlands um, buffer zone, um, you know, as well, you know, too, because it basically, you know, crosses through the middle of the, the area, you know, as on the other side as well, too. So, um, you know, we chose an area, you know, where we're trying to get it as far away from the um, you know, wetlands as possible, but also you know, not to uh, um, have this, you know, near where um, a lot of students um, and staff you know, might park their cars at, um, you know, for for access and, you know, so forth to, to fuel their vehicles, um, you know, up uh, for those that work on the campus. Is there a limit to how much fuel can be actually stored on a on a individual site like this? Do you know? No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure it's more than what we're asking for, you know, which is a thousand gallons and 2,500 gallons. Um, you know, for their um, vehicles, you know, and for their machinery, like their 
um, you know, backhoes, uh, you know, trucks that use diesel and, uh, you know, so forth. Okay. You know, which is basically- One more quick question. Sure. Um, have you made any provisions for electric vehicles um, to be charged? No, uh, not for not for this project. Um, no, we have not. Like I said, um, you know, a, a few Thank years you. ago we did we we did over um, three of the parking lots um, four years ago. Parking lots three, four, and five, and um, yeah, you know, we we didn't incorporate any um, electrical vehicle um, charging stations that. Uh, on this lot at this time. I have a question, I think. Um, so this is gasoline and um, diesel tanks, you said. So um, on the map, kind of towards the 100 foot buff zone. So since it's gasoline and diesel, sometimes the uh, place don't have to put trucks to refill can there, right, as it empties out, I believe. Is that how that works? I'm sorry, because you... Uh, yeah, so still... the gas, the gallon uh, gasoline and the, well, a proposed 1,000 and 2,500 um, gasoline and diesel tanks that would, I guess, be what's fueling the students and workers' cars, those would eventually, here and they have to get refilled by, you know, trucks would have to come there to refill those tanks. Here and there, right? Uh, correct. Uh, so correct. I was just wondering the access that they get to, because I can see that the tanks are closer to the 100-foot buffer zone. So I was just wondering about um, the preventions, I guess, you would take with that, with if any spillage happens when they come to refill those tanks. Well, well the, the tanks are, are filled from the top. Okay. Um, so, um, and these tanks are used for staff only. No students um, or staff members, um, you know, we'll use it it's, it's strictly for the facilities personnel for their daily operations, uh, you know, on, on the campus. And these two tanks that we're proposing are farther away from the 100-foot buffer zone than what is underground right now. Any other questions? Entertain a motion then to continue until the December 13th meeting with hopefully a visit to um, to Massasoit in the interim period. Make a motion to continue to the December 13th meeting one Massasoit Boulevard for the removal and replacement of fuel tank system. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Beekler, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Green, aye. Matt, aye. And Voris, aye. And Kyle, if you could um, set up a, a time when we might be able to visit, that would be great. Yeah, like, do you want to go, Joyce? Uh, the commission members or, yeah? Okay. Commission members might want to go. Sure, yeah, we can we can set something up. Thank you. Okay. So, so Kyle, are you planning to um, arrange this so that um, you can be shown around as to you know what is going on, or um, you know, do I need to make arrangements with the um, facilities director, um, you know, over there to meet with you? I particularly yeah, no, that, that that certainly wouldn't hurt. I think. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, go ahead. No, I just like to see that outflow that you were talking about into the wetland area. I would like to see that, and relative to where the the sites are that you're proposing it come from. Yeah, so I'll, uh, Bill, I'll I'll email you tomorrow, and we can kind of coordinate this. I'll 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 get the commission see set a date, and then we'll we'll kind of move forward, and, and we can discuss uh, if the facility if the facilities manager needs to be present or not. Uh, you know, as we kind of organize this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. 
You're welcome. So the next item on the agenda is number seven, notice of intent for 137 Perkins Avenue. Uh, this is a new notice of intent, is that right? That is correct. We have a DEP number, a butters notification. DEP number. Oh, is... no, okay. yeah, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. We did uh, we did receive a DEP file number, yes. Okay. And let's see, the applicant would be J.K. Hunger. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Mr. Ferry. Good evening, Madam Chair, again. Good evening, Commission members. Uh, Scott Farrier from Home Grid Engineering, uh, representing Foley Management Group, Madam Chair. Uh, on a notice of intent for a property at 137 Perkins Ave. It's a very large uh, gray wooden building. It's the former, most uh, Brockton people know of it as the a former candy factory uh, that's been there. As I said, it's a four story building, looks like an old factory, a lot of windows. Uh, Foley Management Group is a, a national firm that uh, specializes in uh, storage facilities. So they have entered under agreement uh, with the owners of the property to convert that, uh, that large factory building, modernize it, and turn it into a storage facility. Uh, the main reason we're before you folks, it's, it's, as I said, it's a big, big building, has a driveway that goes from Perkins to, to Forest Street. The main reason we're before you folks is the, uh, the majority of the site, the vast majority of the site falls within the FEMA flood zone. Uh, which even though there's, there's no wetlands vegetation, it, it's a resource area uh, for you folks to, to consider. And we have a little bit of construction on the property going on, just some loading docks that need ramps uh, to get up to the loading docks. So because of those uh, loading docks being constructed, they fall within the flood zone. Uh, it becomes work that's under your jurisdiction. So we filed the notice of intent for that work uh, as the as the first part, we've been to the Board of Appeals. We received Board of Appeals approval to convert this uh, commercial building to a storage facility. We need your approval. Once we receive conservation approval, then we'll proceed to the Planning Board for site plan approval. So there's a few steps to go, uh, but yours is, is the one we're at right now. We understand everything was filed. We understand that the project would uh, typically be reviewed by beta. So I think that's essentially where we're at at this point, Madam Chair. We just you know, wanted to make a, a quick introduction, make sure everything's uh, been submitted properly. And then we just like to be able to proceed with the, the whole beta process if we might. I'm glad we've had a, a chance to open it, to open the, the hearing. Could you, do you have a map by any chance of the area? I do. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna try. Do you see that by any chance, Madam Chair? I just see a search the web. I'll vote now, Madam Chair. Not yet. My son left me about an hour ago and said, Dad, we go over this once a month. All you got to do is click this button and it'll show right up. I okay. And he left, and I'm clicking that button, and it's showing up on my screen, but I know it's not on yours. Yeah, uh, I can I can share my screen, Scott. Which plan specifically do you want to look at? The grading and drainage overall? I think sheet number three would be the best one, Kyle. And thank you for the help. To the drainage uh, to the. Uh... Yeah, it's kind of the overall site plan, Madam Chair. That's the the fire truck turn. So I think it would be the one plan before that one, Kyle. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I forgot it here. You have to stop sharing whatever you're sharing, though, Mr. Feria. Because oh, all right, even though it's nothing, it's something. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. All right, perfect. That's it. So sheet number C three. So that shows the the property. As I said, it's a giant building. It takes up the majority of the property. Uh, I think you would say the main entrance is off of Perkins Ave, but the driveway goes all the way out to Forest Street. Currently, it's a it's a gated property. Uh, you know, again, just to give it an overview, it's a storage facility. 
not a lot of parking is required with these facilities, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, just because it's typically one person going in and dropping stuff off or picking stuff up and leaving. So there's not a lot of traffic. It's not a, uh, it's not the kind of thing where the people that have storage units visit the the sites much more than two or three times a year. So it's it's really a low traffic uh, use. As I said, the the couple of things we're doing, if you the uh, inside of the the building corner, we've got a, a large loading dock that were proposed exactly right there. Thank you, Kyle. So if if you had to drop off a refrigerator or a couch or something heavy, you could drive up to the dock, get you inside the facility. Once you're inside the facility, there's freight elevators that could take you to your floor and, and save you a little bit of, uh, of muscle work to get whatever it is that you're moving in. Uh, the other good thing we're doing with this site, Madam Chair, in addition to kind of modernizing and dressing up a, an older building, right now, the site's majority of the site is either building or paving. There are no drainage facilities at all. So under the stormwater management guidelines from both DEP and from the city of Brockton, we have to do uh, some upgrades under the redevelopment part of those stormwater guidelines. So we've uh, proposed some drainage uh, infiltration systems that will handle the roof runoff, which in fact ends up being about 60% of the site. So we're, we're making a vast improvement on the, on the runoff and uh, you know, uh, creating a, a good amount of groundwater recharge that currently does not exist. Right. Uh, the area so, that the area that you were just talking about is that currently grassed or is that you know if that's currently grassed the is area in the back no it's it's paved right now madam chair really the only area that's grassed is the the top side where where i've got the plot number written and there's five or six trees uh bunched together yeah right right around there that's really the only grass part of the whole property the rest of it is is either concrete or paved So, uh, Kyle, as far as compensatory storage is concerned, if if it's already impervious, does that? Uh, so yeah, there are a couple of different things. So there are kind of two two elements here. So Scott mentioned that as a redevelopment of a of an existing site, uh, they need to show I think a forty percent reduction um, right. or or a forty percent improvement in in infiltration. Is that is that correct, Scott? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, so that's from the stormwater ordinance, and then then from the kind of. Uh, wetlands protection uh, angle, um, when they build these ramps, uh, you, and like Scott said, the, uh, the entire site's basically within floodplain. When you build these ramps, you're uh, decreasing the flood storage of that area by adding that concrete uh, for the ramps and the stairs and things like that. So that will require compensatory storage. Uh, and so that's also part of the plan. Um, so beta would be reviewing both the stormwater and the, the, the you know, the infiltration basins and the, uh, the, the, the retaining areas that are part of this development. Correct. Has Beta already um, issued a scope and fee? No, we need, since we, we're just opening the hearing tonight, uh, the commission needs to uh, request that uh, and then we can get Beta moving on the scope and fee. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? In the rendering, I see um, some trees outside uh, the building. Is that proposed tree plantings? Those, the, there's a, I think if you, if you can scroll further down, maybe to sheet number seven, I'll guess, Kyle. Uh, yeah, right there. So th those are our proposed trees. The, the larger trees, the, there's a few existing trees. Uh, but for the most part, all of the trees that you that you see on the plan are proposed trees. So we're doing a, you know, I'd say a, a good amount of plantings around the perimeter, uh, you know, both both for our site, but also to further buffer the existing residential properties on Auburn Street. Even though they've been looking at this big building in their backyard, uh, it get, just gives us the opportunity to provide a little bit of screening as well. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Any other questions at all?
No questions? Recommend that this be a, a motion, I guess, a motion to refer this to beta for review. Can make a motion. Do we need to get public comment? Yes, we do. It is an NOI. Thank you. Sorry about that. Are there participants here that would like to speak to this issue? Sorry about that. No, I don't see anyone with their hands raised. Yeah, I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ruby. Sorry about that. Okay, so I entertain a motion that um, notice of intent for 137 Perkins Ave be referred to beta for review. You make a motion to refer 137 Perkins Ave to beta for review. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay aye. Curtis, I. Green, I. Map, I. Boris, I. And that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. See you soon. Okay. Let's refer to beta. Um, let's see. The Do we need to continue this? Oh, of course. Motion to continue. We make a motion to continue 137 Perkins Ave till December 13th meeting. Will beta have time? Second. Do you think beta will actually have it reviewed by December 13th? If not, it will be continued at that point. Yeah, I think we're it's probably safe to do it just, you know, just in case we get lucky, Madam Chair. If I was gonna bet, I would say uh, yeah, I would say no, we're probably gonna get asked for a continuance, but Thank you. The season of miracles, who knows? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Go ahead with the motion, please. Make a motion to continue 137 Perkins Ave till December 13th meeting. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Girl, call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Green, aye. Map, aye. Boris, aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Nine forty Belmont Street. You said that that has been um, withdrawn for now, and it's going to be involved with the NOI through the VA at another time. That is correct. Number nine will not be heard at this point. So the next item on the agenda would be number 10, Certificate of Compliance uh, for 195 Liberty Street, a freestanding sign. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, so I spoke with the representative, uh, his name is Bill Self, uh, earlier this morning. Um, in my agent report, uh, I basically outlined that I do not think that uh, the project is in compliance with the order of conditions, and I do not recommend that the commission uh, issue a certificate of compliance. Uh, the reason being, uh, there was an area around the sign installation that was supposed to be seated uh, and stabilized. Uh, it's immediately next to like a ditch that, that has open water, um, and uh, it, it hasn't uh, been stabilized sufficiently. Uh, Bill agrees with me uh, after he's seen my report. Um, he's not here tonight. I spoke to him this morning. I told him that he didn't need to be here. He agrees that he uh, needs to go back out and, and, and do some additional work there. He's talked to the uh, the owner uh, and told them that they need to recede. So um, in my recommendation, I recommended that the commission deny this uh, certificate of compliance request. Uh, and then with the understanding that the applicant will uh, make the changes necessary and reapply with a new certificate of compliance request uh, in the future when uh, all of those uh, things are met. Commissioners, do you feel like you need to see pictures or photos or anything or you okay with with Kyle's review? Yeah, I reviewed what was on the file. I'm fine. Okay, good. Okay. So I entertain a motion then to deny the request for a certificate of compliance for 195 Liberty Street. I make a motion to deny the certificate of compliance for 195 Liberty Street. I second the motion. 
motion has been made and seconded that <clears throat> this uh, request for a certificate of, compl of compliance will be um, denied um, until the aforementioned points are addressed, right? Yeah. <laughs> motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Before I. Clay, I. Curtis, I. In I. Map, I. Voris, I. Okay, thank you. And Kyle, you'll notify the applicant, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll send the letter. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay. And then the next filings, next five filings are continued. Um, <coughs> the rest, let me see. The first one is uh, the next violation discussion is 1003 Crescent Street. Yes, that is correct. Correct. Um, and uh, Mr. Porter uh, is in the attendees. Um, I'm going to go ahead and promote him. I know Scott's here also to speak to this tonight. Correct. Um, I guess I can begin here, Scott, and I'll let you take over here in a moment. Um, this is outlined in my in my uh, uh, notice that I sent out, uh, like the violation notice to uh, Mr. Porter. Uh, basically, um, around the beginning of October, I received uh, a few different calls from different different departments, different people, uh, kind of reporting that there were uh, dump trucks full of uh, of fill that were being uh, delivered to the site at uh, 10, uh, 1003 Crescent Street. Um, and uh, there are wetlands uh, behind some of these properties back in this area. The trucks were going off the road quite a ways uh, and, and dumping, uh, but you couldn't really tell where. Um, so I went out to the site um, initially and kind of uh, uh, asked them to stop until we could figure out exactly what was going on. I spoke to, uh, I believe it was Mr. Porter, um, and we kind of... Uh, he assured me that you know we were they were outside the buffer zone. Uh, we ended up going to the site uh, later that day or the following day. It's been a month or so now, so I'm not quite sure. But we went out on site. They stopped all work, um, you know, putting more fill back there. Um, we uh, when we were on site together, um, we identified wet areas. I didn't do a, a, an actual delineation at the time, but we we looked we looked at areas that could be uh, jurisdictional. Uh, we measured out. The 100 foot buffer zone that, that that is jurisdictional, you know, assuming those are wetland resource areas, and we added like another 20 feet onto that, and we put flags. Uh, basically, I advised them to do no more work within that that you know tentatively flagged area until um, they could hire uh, someone to come out and do a formal delineation, uh, and then at that point uh, we could kind of assess where we are with with everything. Uh, if there were any infractions, uh, then we could address any remediation that needed to happen then. Um, after that delineation was done. Um, as of today, uh, Mr. Ferry uh, sent um, uh, a wetland delineation done by ECR um, and Brad Holmes. I believe it was Brad uh, today. So um, oh, we just received that. Uh, I did upload that to the file, um, but I'm going to let Scott take over now. Um, but that's kind of where we were. Um, we, we just issued the, the notice of violation. The reason, sorry, going to backtrack a little bit. The reason I didn't issue an enforcement order initially was because uh, we, I wasn't quite sure where the wetland resource areas were. Um, and, uh, I wasn't sure the extent of the violation. So we went with the violation notice initially, uh, I requested that they do this formal delineation. So then we can kind of reassess, um, after that point to, to kind of see what the next steps would be. Um, and then, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Scott, I, I believe, uh, has more to add at this point, uh, through you, please. Sure. Thank you, uh, Kyle. Madam Chair, Commission members, again, Scott Farrier from Holmgren Engineering. Uh, Mr. Porter and his partner, Mr. O'Brien, contacted me uh, shortly after receiving your uh, violation notice. And uh, we took a look at the at the notice, uh, looked at the mass GIS maps, other things, and we, we decided that, you know, the best course of action to, to satisfy ourselves and, and the Commission would be to have the the property delineated. Uh, we contacted and contracted Brad Holmes from, from ECR and uh, we just received the report, uh, I believe it was last week. So it's, you know, as you know, Madam Chair, everybody's busy. Everything takes three or four weeks to, to get any kind of action on it. So, uh, so Brad went out there and flagged it. We submitted uh, via email, as Kyle said this morning, 
uh, his report and his sketch uh, that shows the wetland areas. Now, the wetland areas, I believe there's four separate areas. One of them is in the very, very far back left-hand corner of the property. That is a BVW, a bordering vegetative wetland that just barely encroaches onto our property. The other three areas, uh, what we would call isolated wetland areas that don't appear to be jurisdictional. They're, they're definitely not bordering. The only thing they could possibly be would be an isolated land subject to flooding, uh, but that's based typically on topography and engineering calcs, which we just haven't done yet. Uh, but in any event, th those areas all fall outside of the property. Obviously, there would still be buffer zones that encroach on our property. So uh, the applicants at this point are, are hoping to uh, to develop the property, to, to be frank with you. They're, they're hoping they can uh, turn it into some type of residential development at, at this point. We honestly haven't done a thing, so I can't tell you if it's going to be one lot or twenty-one lots. It's it's not a big piece of property, so it's a it, it's a small uh, a small development that potentially could could happen out there. So what we uh, what we spoke about, Scott, do you mind if I screen share the the, the wetland map? Better you than I, Kyle. Okay, great. Uh, so what we spoke about, Madam Chair, was uh, at least at this point coming tonight. Uh, yeah, so that's it there. So the the A1 through A8 in the, the very lower right-hand corner as you're looking at it here, that's the BVW. The other areas are, are isolated wetland areas. Uh, exactly so, a property, the, the property that you're speaking of. But what's the actual property boundary? Is it, it that entire area? Right, it's right there. Those, the skinny okay. rectangles are two paper streets. Uh, okay. that about our property. And then we have the house in the front at 1003 Crescent in the long rectangle behind it. So as I said, though, you can see those wetland areas, at least according to Brad's flagging, and it's, it's not a survey location, but they're usually fairly accurate. They they fall almost entirely off the property. Obviously, we would still have buffer zone, uh, you know, buffer zone impacts. So what, what we've, uh, what we spoke about this morning, uh, with Mr. Porter and Mr. O'Brien was at least in addition to, to the flags that Kyle set, uh, you know, with the property owners back a month ago or so, uh, was to look at Brad's flags now, pace out that hundred feet that, that we're talking about in any work that they've done that falls in that buffer zone uh, to surround it with a silt sock to at least stabilize it. Uh, the agreement is that we, they certainly won't do any more work in that area right now, but at least if we put the silt sock in, that'll, That'll take care of any uh, any potential erosion impacts, and that'll give us a chance to to get moving with uh, with some development plans. And uh, we were hoping once we get those plans ready to submit to you, any kind of I mean, to be honest with you, any kind of enhancements or any work in the buffer zone, more than likely we we would file uh, for that work as part of our notice of intent. So any uh, any kind of buffer zone enhancements that needed to be done would kind of be lumped in at that point with the notice of intent, uh, with your permission, obviously, Madam Chair. So that's that's what we're hoping to do. As I said, right now, uh, put up some silt sock around any disturbed areas that are uh, close to your buffer zone and uh, just let things kind of settle down until we can get some plans before uh, you and the other city departments that would need to review anything. It was wonderful that you took such rapid action, truly. Thank you. They, they, you know, they're certainly not looking for any trouble. Didn't really, you know, didn't, they felt like there was that wetland way in the back, to be honest with you, Madam Chair, but didn't think there was any other areas towards the front of the property. So didn't think they were uh, doing anything wrong or getting in any kind of a, any kind of trouble. So uh, just hoping to resolve that and be able to move forward, uh, you know, with the city's help, Madam Chair. Mr. Holden, do you have any questions or comments or suggestions or? Uh, uh, no, I, I think that, um, you know, as, as Scott kind of outlined, um, it, without having this delineated kind of more formally, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, you know, what the next action should be. But if they are planning on on developing this, which seems to be the case, 
Um, I think that any any sort of remediation that would be required uh, can be handled uh, at that time. Um, and I think that, as Scott mentioned, you know, if they put erosion controls around all the disturbed areas there now, um, that will likely hold us over until uh, we get to that point where the notices of intent is filed. And through that process, the, the commission can have uh, you know input as to what you want to require, uh, if anything, uh, to to address any any disturbances within that that buffer zone area that wouldn't already be covered with the development as part of the, a new lot, uh, for example. So I think that um, I, I'm content with that as as a kind of a middle ground here. I, I would hate to uh, have them do all this extra work to 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 remove all you know any any, any of this you know fill they've kind of added back there. Uh, just to turn around, you know, in, in six months and have them start developing that lot. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So that's kind of my, my thought. I think, I think the, the, the solution that Scott's put forward uh, seems pretty reasonable to me. Where on this particular uh, um, lot were the, um, it looked like someone had actually made road, had actually put roads in. So yeah, I can kind of speak to that here. So this is the access area that they came in. They basically drove in on this, this paper road so it's not paved, but, uh, and this is kind of where the, the main access was. They did some fill uh, in the back of the lot here, but most of it was kind of dumped, uh, you know, kind of back in this area. So, you know, but again, without knowing where those lines were, it was hard to say where the violations actually had occurred. Um, so I think that, you know, we can kind of bundle all of this uh, together with the notice of intent, um, if that's, you know, amenable to the, to the commission. Commissioners? I clarify. So if they we uh I I don't know what happened with the enforcement, but if they get to the point where they can go through with the notice and intent, we would also get with the that the plan site with the proper delineation of these wetlands, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, just because with the map here doesn't completely match the report, so that site map if they move forward to the NOI. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. On this map, are there two paper roads, one on each side of the property? Is, yes, that's, that yeah, that's correct. There are two paper streets. There's kind of a series of paper streets up and down uh, Crescent Street. This, this is way down near the uh, near the Whitman Town line. Uh, so the, yeah, there's there's a whole series of paper streets that go off of Crescent Street. So those are two of them that have not been constructed. Thank you. Do they plan on paving on um, both of those um, to if they put in residence for accessibility or for developing the land? I know you've heard this already tonight, and, and I, I don't want to mislead you in any way, but certainly that that would be just looking at it. And, and we honestly, you know, just really started on it today. As you're looking at the screen right now, that roadway to the right we wouldn't be able to build that because of those wetland areas that are that are right on top of it. So if there is going to be any development, which we're pretty sure we can get something going, it would be the the roadway as you're looking at the screen uh, to the left. Yeah, exactly. That would be the road. They would have to pave it. There's planning board rules and regs. They would have to construct a cul-de-sac uh, for turnaround and emergency vehicles and school buses and obviously drainage that you folks would review and a, a whole bunch of stuff. But more than likely, it would come in uh, it would be reconstructing that that paper street. Do you know what the lot size is, Mr. Faria? I don't, to be honest with you, Madam Chair. No idea by looking at it, but okay. Thank what, you. Yeah, thank you. Questions at all? I, I think this is informational only, correct? If it's a, um, since it's just a, a violation notification, we don't have to take any action or anything. That's that's correct. I guess the, the one thing that I would recommend is, uh, uh, Scott, once the uh, erosion controls are in place, if you wouldn't mind notifying me, that way I can go out there and kind of confirm that. And then it, at that point, I'm kind of content with uh, letting things kind of lie until we get that uh, notice of intent, you know, subject to the commission's approval. Without an enforcement order. Without, without moving forward with an enforcement order or requiring any immediate action. Uh, you know, pending this 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 development project that that's likely incoming. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ferry. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your time tonight and your patience. Thank Have you. a good night.
Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. So there are two enforcement orders that we only have left to finish. The first one is at 803 Crescent Street. Uh, yes, and I spoke to the property owner, uh, Mr. Bruno Silva, today uh, concerning this. Um, and I will pull up a map in one moment here. I kind of like the little banana. Um, yeah, right. All right, stop sharing that. All right, um, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, this is a this is an older enforcement order. Um, this is for 803 Crescent Street. Uh, the, the, I think the order was issued initially by um, Agent Shave um, maybe about a year ago, December, I think, of 2022 was the initial enforcement order, or shortly thereafter. Uh, there had just been a, a recent uh, ownership uh, change of this property. It's a, it's a kind of a repair garage on Crescent Street. Um, the uh, the new owner, uh, well, I guess before the, the new owner took ownership of this property, the previous owner had uh, extended the pavement uh, of the parking area around the garage, um, and and that without without approval from the commission. That's kind of why the initial enforcement order was issued. You can see here, there's Beaver Brook back here. Uh, the center of the stream is this this teal line. Uh, the edge of bank is the let's see, I think that's the the the, the green line here. So um, anyway, it's within uh, basically the whole site's within floodplain. And uh, then it's also within riverfront area. So it's jurisdictional under the CONCOM. Um, and uh, we issued the enforcement order. We've been out to the site a couple of times. Uh, Joyce went out with me uh, and uh, at least trip of beta, um, probably in May or April, um, and talked to uh, Mr. Silva about next steps because he's, he's wanting to work with the commission uh, to, 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 to solve this problem. Um, currently, uh, we've required that he uh, work with with uh, an engineer to uh, to develop some sort of remediation plan. Uh, what we see before us tonight is just an existing conditions plan. So uh, he's working with uh, Hol Holmgren Engineering here uh, and, and they put together those plan for him. And what I've asked them to do is uh, delineate the, the buffer zones, uh, basically the whole site, more or less up until this red line buffer zone, uh, the 100 foot buffer zone is basically within floodplain two. Um, so, uh, but this is just the existing conditions plan. Uh, the, the the added concrete that was the reason for the enforcement order is this kind of uh, grayed out area here and this grayed out area here. This uh, hashed building is the existing building. So um, what I've, and I put this on the agenda tonight uh, for the commission, uh, uh, Mr. Silva couldn't be here. Let me just make sure that he's not here. Um, yeah, they have no more attendees. So uh, he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make the meeting tonight. So I was going to convey uh, our discussion to him uh, over the phone tomorrow. So uh, my goal kind of tonight is just to get some guidance uh, to give to Mr. Silva about what the commission expects him to do um, to kind of remediate this issue. So um, I can kind of outline the resource concerns for us tonight and then we can kind of have that discussion. So part of the problem is that they've uh, they've impacted the the flood the floodplain the the flood zone um, by adding this this concrete area they've they've uh, added fill to the flood zone um, so what we would normally require is that there would be some sort of compensatory storage uh, added to this site to to kind of offset that fill that that concrete that was added into the flood zone so that's one aspect of this uh, another is um, and I'll have to confirm this, but I, I believe that the the new pavement addition uh, does not slope uh, towards the road, but it actually slopes back uh, towards the resource area. So there are concerns there about contamination from any sort of fuel leaks uh, or other fluids. Uh, these are kind of uh, you know cars that need maintenance or need to be repaired. So uh, there is always that potential that that, that things are uh, running off uh, onto this pavement and then then into this resource area. Um, a couple suggestions or ideas that I've kind of had, and again, we would convey this information to the applicant and then he would work with the engineers to develop something uh, to kind of meet our expectations uh, as the commission. Um, one option is we can require them to remove all the added, added concrete, just restore things to how they were initially. Um, that's an option. 
Another option is to maybe do some engineering on the site to to kind of offset uh, the flood the flood zone impacts, um, and then maybe do something to uh, to work with uh, any sort of uh, to to deal with that 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 contamination issue that that may also be uh, occurring here. So you can see here on the map this existing gravel area that's between basically the uh, the edge of pavement and uh, this kind of swiggly line here is the the tree line. So there's quite a bit of, of, of area here that could be um, uh, kind of uh, not redeveloped, but um, maybe turned back into a green space. Uh, so this might be area that they could do some sort of like a retention area to offset uh, the the added addition addition of the of the con uh, or the paved area. Um, you could do some sort of planting in there as well. Uh, to oh, Joyce has a question. Go ahead, Joyce. That's what it looks. If the orange line is the 50, that looks like that area would be within 25. No, that area that that gravel existing gravel area might be pretty close to the 25. Oh, yeah, it's almost certainly within the 25 foot buffer zone. This, this gravel area. Yes. And then probably probably they don't have it marked on here. The 25 like uh, foot buffer zone, but that, that likely would clip off a portion of this uh, part of the pavement as well, you know. So that's something that we can have them look at that. But generally, uh, you know, we just kind of need to give them some guidance what, what the commission expects them to do. Um, I'm not sure how uh, adding concrete upon concrete works. Like one one thing that we could do is ask them to uh, to change the, the 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 grade of the the new concrete so to make sure that it slopes towards the existing uh, parking lot and into the into the sewer system rather than sloping it towards the, the resource area. Um, but I'm not sure if that's something they can do without um, without completely redoing uh, the pavement, if that makes sense. I, I just don't know if you can add new pavement on old pavement and have it be something that's going to last very long, or if that's just going to be a patch that's going to flake off and, and chip off over the next five years. Um, you know, so we don't necessarily want that either. So, you know, um, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we can do some sort of uh, compensatory storage where this existing gravel is, and then maybe make that pull all the gravel out, kind of do some remediation to this area, add the compensatory storage there if it's possible, and then uh, make that plant it, you know, so it's not gravel. Um, and, and that might, if we plant this with, with and have it established with, you know, grass or, or whatever mix we decide on, um, that can help treat any sort of runoff that, that does end up coming, uh, sheet flowing off of this, this portion of the parking lot before it uh, gets to the to the Beaver Brook back here. That's kind of my thought. Uh, but before we uh, move forward, and I just gave my my recommendations to uh, uh, Mr. Silva, I wanted to kind of get the input of the commission to see what what we are thinking generally um, as far as recommendations. What is the gravel area for? Or is that for snow removal? You know, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I, and that's the gravel area is obviously also within jurisdiction. I'm not sure when that gravel was added. Um, I don't I don't think he doesn't really park things there. Um, as far as I know, um, it's just kind of a, a dead dead use space. It, it's not it's not used for anything as far as I'm aware of. And it does lead out to the road. <clears throat> so, but you can bring equipment into the 25 foot, foot buffer and actually put in Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can do work all the way up to the bank and, and, and as long as we use the right safeguards. So the, the commission can the the 25 foot like no touch zone isn't that's not in the regulations. That's just kind of a thing that most commissions don't, don't allow any work to be done within that area. Doesn't mean you can't do work in that area. I um, mean, especially if you're doing like remediation work, you know, you, you're we're trying to improve this, make it more natural. We're removing um, you know, th this gravel, uh, even if you're excavating Joyce, if it, if, if it's, if it's to deal with the floodplain, um, I think that that also can be permit, permit, permittable. I can certainly look into that more, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, we can approve work even within that 25 foot buffer zone. If we, you know, think it's a reasonable, you know, thing to suggest. Hmm. And would compensatory storage be something like a big rain garden that, or a, is that what you're thinking? Or uh, you kind of broke up there. What 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 did you say? Thinking of a rain garden kind of thing, or yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, you you can do infiltration 
basins, but that's going to be a lot more engineering work, uh, and likely that would be underneath the existing uh, paved area, probably. But you can kind of do the same thing if you have the space for it. Um, and I don't know if this is even possible because, you know, between the, the bank, you would have to do calculations to, uh, to, to see how much fill has been added with the concrete and then like how much area you need to excavate uh, to, to make up for that, that added area. Right. Um, and if that's going to fit into this area with, with the appropriate grade. So you're not just like having a 60% a slope that goes down. I don't know if it's possible, but that's kind of what I would look to have them explore and see if that's something they can develop. And yeah, some sort of rain garden thing where it's, it's an excavated area. It's all green. It's got plants in there uh, not, not just grass, you know, you can have other, other things in there. Um, but that would help uh, with the compensatory storage. Uh, and then also that would maybe treat any sort of runoff that, that, that happens to come off, uh, of that, of that sloped, you know, sloped asphalt, uh, before it goes into the brook. That's kind of my thought. I just, I, and I just don't know if you can add, uh, and change the grade of that concrete without ripping the whole thing out. I have no idea. So, so I mean, I just need some guidance. I can have this discussion with, with Mr. Silva and, uh, and this is, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Faria is putting this this plan together for him, so I can I can have this discussion with him as well. And we can kind of work something out. But I just wanted some guidance from the commission as far as uh, what what we would like to see as the commission uh, to kind of rectify this situation. Because you know normally uh, we probably wouldn't permit this, uh, but it's already here, so we we can just have them remove it, um, or we can maybe work with the applicant because he he didn't do this work. He he bought this without knowing that this was an issue. Uh, he kind of inherited this mess. So I'm kind of of the mind if we're able to work with him that we that we should. Um, but again, this is all up to the to the you know the the discretion of the commission. Kyle, were you able to determine if that actually was required for the sale, the um, installation of those additional parking spots? No, I, I can I can follow up with the I'm, I can I'm talking to him tomorrow. I'll give him a call and um, I can dig some more into that. Um, do you care about uh, maybe uh, explaining that a little bit more for the rest of the commission, Joyce? Sure. When we were there and we were speaking, we were speaking, Mr. Uh, Silva to Silva, Silva, right? Yeah, just just the S, Silva. Um, he had just recently bought the property, seriously, within a couple of months, and all of this stuff came crashing in on him. And he uh, moved in from Dorchester and was all excited to start a, uh, it's like a auto repair shop and also um, something to be able to sell uh, used automobiles. And my understanding was the licensing board, in order for him to actually be able to sell, the licensing board required that he have additional parking spots. And so the owner, before he sold, was the one that actually installed those, installed that additional um, impervious surface. So when he bought, when he bought the property, it sounded like it was almost a requirement that that be installed for the sale. But then when he actually came through and got the sale, lo and behold, he gets an enforcement order because of that additional um, impervious surface and how it's impacting that whole resource area. So it, it's just this catch-22, and he seriously is just trying to establish a business in the city. Um, slow business at first, certainly, because part of it was COVID related and uh, no um, secondhand cars available to be sold. So it was just like, he really wasn't making a whole ton of money at the time. I mean, I'm hopefully business has picked up for him since then. I don't know. But but to have the um, the cost that would be, um, that could potentially um, come forward as a result of extensive drainage and all of that kind of stuff, it's, it's uh, pretty daunting for him, which I totally understand. Um, it, it seems like so much is outside of his control. So where if it, if this was just a, a straight up normal, someone that's out of compliance, just, you know, doesn't care and just, you know, um, it, I can understand really trying to enforce the enforcement order um, maybe more rigorously. But I feel like he... Um, does deserve as much help as we can give him. Um, any ideas that anyone has, I think, would be greatly, you know, greatly appreciated. Um, I I agree, Joyce. I remember the previous owner of this property. 
and how disastrous this whole thing was. So if we have someone who's willing to do whatever's required to get their business going, I do think, like you just said, we should probably do whatever we can to help him. So I think, Kyle, if you and Scott can have the conversation of some type of recommendations to guide him and get him where you know, things are comfortable for him to continue to proceed further, I think would be in the best interest of him as well as everything that's been going on with this property. Okay, so um, just to, so I'll work with uh, uh, the engineering uh, firm here and, and maybe are we looking at trying to develop some sort of like compensatory storage rain garden thing here on site if possible? Is that kind of what we've, we're going to kind of push, push for? Yeah, so any way that you can drain the stuff towards the cities, uh, you know. Just... Yeah, I mean, we'll look into that too. Um, uh, and I... We could even like if adding that concrete layer does not work, there could be some sort of routing we could do. Um, you know, the, the, we we'll, we'll we'll I'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll 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 work with Scott um, about developing some sort of rain garden retention, compensatory storage kind of thing. Uh, that's better probably than doing uh, an infiltration system because that's gonna be a lot more expensive and it's going to require repaving of the lot. So if we can do something, and I think if we can improve that existing gravel area, because right now it's kind of a dead space, nothing's growing there. I think that'll be kind of a net boon uh, for the area anyway. So that's kind of my thought. Um, so if the commission's okay with that, I will make that recommendation to Mr. Silva and I'll, I'll work with uh, you know JK uh, Holmgren Engineering to, to kind of develop a plan that we can then bring before the commission for approval. That sound reasonable. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Um, does the scallop edges, it says tree line, are those is that existing trees or proposed like no, right underneath kind of existing wooded area back here? Yeah. Well, okay. okay. And he has done a lot like just cleaning up trash in there and all of that, you know. I but the river is right there. <laughs> the brook is right there, you know. What about I that? I think um, if we could put in something like a French drain, so for any you know fluids from cars, you know if you're selling cars, repairing cars, and you have it uh, empty out into the sewage system, the public sewage system, I think that would that would into the storm drain. I mean, yes, yeah, storm drain oh, filters there, wouldn't he? And be able to when you have some kind of filter. I don't know, like that's something we'll have to look into. I'm not sure what the regulations for that, but that's something we can certainly look into. Maybe if we uh lined uh, put it like a French drain or something, even if it was just um you know rip wrap or something and had it uh with some sort of uh tile underneath that would that would direct flow uh from that new addition like towards uh somewhere where it's just not, not going directly into the to the to the brook. Yeah, okay. Oi. All right. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your input, everyone. Um, I will convey all of this uh, to the applicant and the engineering firm, and we can move forward from there. And hopefully we'll get a plan to you, uh, you know, in the next couple months. Um, and Herman Street? Uh, yeah. And this is the last one. I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, I don't think there's anyone here uh, to speak to this. Uh, this is an an ongoing uh, problematic property that's been issued multiple enforcement orders from the commission over the years. Um, I've been requested to uh, issue a, a fresh uh, enforcement order. Um, I did in that enforcement order uh, ask that the property owner um, be at the meeting tonight. They are obviously not here. Um, so I guess at this point um, I can review some photos, but basically what they've done, this the, the property owner owns a construction company. Um, they are bringing material from their construction jobs back to the property in question, uh, kind of dumping that those that waste material uh, into their backyard. And they're kind of bulldozing uh, this waste material over their property line uh, into a parcel that's owned by the city. And there's a brook that runs through there that's jurisdictional. Um, and so uh, they're, they're just basically adding fill and, and trash and debris uh, uh, into this, this protected area. 
Uh, and that's basically what the enforcement order is for. I went uh, to the site with uh, a few members of the health department. Um, they cited uh, this individual the same day uh, that I cited that I issued this enforcement order for various other health code violations. Um, but our 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 big concern is uh, all this fill that's being added um, to this to this lot over this property line. So there are a couple issues. It's the property line issue. Then there's the the resource issue with the uh, the brook that runs through there, and there's all the trash and debris that's being added. So um, because they're not here to uh, to speak to this tonight uh, or to uh, to talk about how they're willing to address this issue with the commission, um, at this point I think uh, we just ratify the enforcement order. And I think um, the next step is that uh, because this is an ongoing issue, uh, the, the the Brockton Law Department is is looking to to make a case. And you're sure that he received the uh, uh, enforcement order? Yeah, I think I, I got the green slip. And do you know if it's an issue of of language understanding? Uh, it is not to my to my knowledge. I'll, I'll I can confirm that with the uh, the health inspectors. I've never met this individual, but they they they've been interacting with him for a while. So I, I don't think there's a language barrier. Motion then to ratify the enforcement order for 34th Herman Street. Motion to ratify the enforcement order for 34 Herman Street. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to ratify the enforcement order. Um, roll call vote, please. Equal aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Jane aye. Knapp aye. And Boris aye. Thank you, Kyle. All right. Thank you all. And that is it. Yeah. So I entertain a motion to uh, a motion to adjourn. Second, anyone? Second. Okay. We all say aye. <laughs> aye. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Good night.